morning and happy Friday to you. You're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quit Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines this morning. Asian equities trade mixed following a rally in US stocks despite political turmoil in the UK. The Indian government has sought the help of Tata Sons to buy a stake in the struggling Jet Airways. The board of Tata Sons is set to deliberate, uh, deliberate the matter uh, later today. That's a Bloomberg exclusive. The United Kingdom plunges into a leadership crisis with as many as four ministers quitting Theresa May's cabinet over the Brexit deal. And after falling to a five-month low in September, India's trade deficit widened again in the, in the month of October, led by imports of crude and a weaker rupee. Let's talk about the US markets now. They closed higher on Thursday, halting a five-day fall. The S&P 500 uh, especially uh, was higher by about 1.06 percent and, and that's as cautious optimism took hold following a report that the US may back off from its stance against China on trade while uh, so solid economic data offset underwhelming earnings uh, from Walmart. Sue Keenan of Bloomberg News wraps up all the action on Wall Street in this report. The Thursday session was a volatile one that snapped the five-day slide in stocks in the regular session but reignited the sell-off after hours. In the regular session, we saw tech lead the way higher, mainly by a rebound in Apple, which helped rise the uh, semiconductor sector. We also saw, after a retreat midday, the industrials lead the way higher on an indication there may be some progress in a possible talk between the U.S. and China, trade-related, before the G20. Oil also continued a second day higher, despite a bearish buildup in U.S. supplies. After hours, the real story began. AMD, the biggest maker of chips that had been up in the regular sector, and NVIDIA, the largest maker of graphic chips used in video games, both gave lackluster forecasts, and that caused a dramatic sell-off. NVIDIA fell as much as 17%. AMD was down 9%. Rival chip makers were also taking hits. Nordstrom, yet another retailer indicating that discounts are causing them to cut into gross margins, was down as much as 10 percent. And in yet another surprise move, the California Public Utility Commission announced it did not want PG&E, the big utility that may have caused the wildfires that are now a catastrophe in California, did not want the utility to file for bankruptcy. That news alone caused PG&E shares to rocket higher by 44 percent. The company could still see its credit rating cut to junk. In New York, Sukinen, Bloomberg News. All right. Now, U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross says the U.S. still plans to raise tariffs on Chinese imports in January, with President Donald Trump and Xi, uh, China's Xi Jinping likely at best to agree on a framework for further talks to resolve trade tensions at their meeting, which is scheduled to take place at the end of November. Bloomberg's Greg Sullivan brings us all the details in this report. Uh, on the one hand, we did hear that the Chinese have provided the U.S. with a list of concessions. Uh, those have been alternately described as both a starting point in negotiations and a, a positive sign, but also as nothing new or, or that or likely to meet President Trump's bar for concessions. Uh, this upcoming meeting uh, was always expected to be sort of a starting point for a framework because the U.S. demands are very steep. The U.S. is looking for fundamental changes to how China has oriented its economy and to its industrial policy. Wilbur Ross even saying that the U.S. has a long list of demands for the Chinese to meet. So in that sense, this is always likely to be just a framework, uh, a stepping stone to potentially more talks uh, as they progress. But undoubtedly still a good sign that the two sides are talking. All right. Uh, well, uh, let's uh, go across live now to Bloomberg's Rosalind Chin, who's joining us from Hong Kong with all the updates on the Asian markets. Uh, well, Rosalind, how are you seeing things uh, this morning? Well, certainly, as uh, was just mentioned uh, by my Bloomberg colleagues, we've got a few factors playing in here in Asia as well. One uh, is NVIDIA, the uh, biggest uh, semiconductor maker for gaming uh, in the world. And that, of course, is going to affect uh, Asian tech and uh, chip stocks here as well. So we are seeing uh, stocks like SoftBank uh, taking a hit today, also STMSE and also King Yuan Electric uh, Electronics uh, dropping uh, in the session so far, this, um, so far this session. And that's obviously because of the knock-on effect from the NVIDIA 
uh, information which came out in the US. We're also the trade issues that are still hanging over the region and globally of course as well with it seems like uh, while there are uh, it's, uh, burgeonings of hope that something may come up come out of these talks between Trump and Xi Jinping later in the month at the uh, Buenos Aires meet of the G20. There are also efforts, it seems, to sort of keep those uh, hopes in check. Well, Barossa was mentioned you're coming out and, and, and saying that it, well, tariffs are still in place, they're still planned for January, and also putting a little bit of a dampener on the hopes of anything really solid or com you know, conclusive to come out of these talks uh, at the moment. So still a lot of uncertainty hanging around uh, in the Asia region. We're seeing the MSCI Asia Pacific Index losing about a fifth of 1% just couldn't hang on to its gains uh, from the previous session but uh, we saw the emerging markets uh, stocks doing a little bit better the MSCI emerging markets index actually just about hanging on to gains there for a third session so far this week now uh, elsewhere in the region we're looking at education stocks now China came up with a new policy of saying that uh, uh, basically companies may not invest in for-profit kindergartens and education is a huge industry um, here in uh, Hong Kong and in China as well. Uh, ed many, many people in this region are keen and willing to invest in education and pay a lot of money for their kids' education and it has been a really growing business uh, in, in the region and we are seeing now these education stocks really taking a hit here. We've got companies like Maple Leaf Education, China Yuhua Education and Wisdom Education all listed in Hong Kong falling, um, well, China Yuhua and Wisdom are both falling by more than 20%, Maple Leaf down by 17% at this um, point in time, the Hang Seng Index down by about half of 1% so far this session. Back All right. Uh, well, thanks so much for that, Rosalind. Let's uh, turn to an update from uh, the UK. We've been bringing you updates every day. An embattled Theresa May vowed to fight on as UK Prime Minister on Thursday in the face of intense opposition to her troubled Brexit deal. She has faced down a wave of resignations and demands for her to step down as leader. Her statements come after seven members of her government resigned, declaring that they could not support the draft Brexit agreement that she struck with the European Union this week. Conservative MPs lined up to declare that they had submitted their letters to party officials demanding a vote of confidence in her leadership. But May is standing firm. Here's what she said. Leadership is about taking the right decisions, not the easy ones. As Prime Minister, my job is to bring back a deal that delivers on the vote of the British people, uh, that does that by ending free movement, all the things I raised in my statement, ending free movement, ensuring we're not sending vast annual sums to the EU any, year, uh, any longer, ending the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, but also protects jobs and protects people's livelihoods, protects our security, protects uh, the Union of the United Kingdom. I believe that this is a deal which does deliver that, which is in the national interest. And am I going to see this through? Yes. Well, the currency, the pound, saw a lot of pressure. And uh, though it did uh, uh, come back a slight bit while May was talking, it still declined about 1.6% against the dollar to end at about one28 Let's move on now and talk about the Indian market. Darshan Mehta is here to tell you all about the trade <coughs> setup for the day at the end of the week and also to tell you what the cues are from the futures and options space. Darshan, well, I, I can't see the clearest uh, picture from Asia this morning, but at least it was a positive session in the US. How is it looking in India? Yeah, so the SX50 is indicating a positive outlook uh, despite, uh, you know, Asia looking slightly uh, you know, mixed at this point of time, as you pointed out. But uh, we will be clearly about the 10,600 10, mark in trade. So uh, pull up the SGX Nifty, it's, it's indicating a gap up of uh, 43 points, which means that we will be about the 10,650 mark in trade. How did the ADRs pan out in trade? And most of them managed to do well. Vedanta was up 3%, Tata Motors up 2.5%, Wipro, HDFC Bank also up close to 2% in trade. So uh, in fact, all the ADRs ended with a positive bias. So uh, that's the cue that we're getting in. Uh, yesterday, the Nifty managed to move up by 40 points, uh, but uh, uh, there was equal, uh, you know, movement as far as the mid cap and small cap end of the market is concerned. So, uh, so it wasn't the best of trading session, but nevertheless, we ended higher. Uh, Nifty Bank was up close to one percent. The Nifty PSU Bank was up close to half a percent. Uh, which were the sectors that uh, did well? Real estate, for one, did well. 
it was up almost 1.7 percent fmcg pretty much was the only sector which ended with a negative bias yesterday so that's the trend that we are getting in uh, from our markets fi is a net buy of almost 2000 crores but remember the kotak deal of uh, 1500 crores uh, was there uh, so that would mellow down to close to five less than 500 crores of net buying by fi's di sold in 165 crores in the cash market now, what contributed to the move on the Nifty? Basically, the banks, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, the HDFC Twin, and Axis Bank managed to move up. What didn't do well was Yes Bank uh, because of the issues as far as resignations were concerned. Grassim was down because of uh, you know the deal with Vodafone that's there and the results. ITC and India Bulls Housing Finance continued their view way on the downside. So that's the trend on the Nifty. What happened with the futures and option market? Uh, you could see that there was a little bit of short covering that was seen on the Nifty. If you pull up the Nifty Bank, there was a fresh buying that was seen open interest build up of 11 percent and remember uh, yesterday was the nifty bank weekly expiry and that is why there was traction where is positions where are positions being taken from 10,600 to higher levels call writers are active and from 10,600 to lower levels put writers are active the broad range the narrow range as of now remains 10,500 to 10,700 and the broad range remains from 10,200 uh, to 11,000 what happened in trade yesterday since the market moved up put writers were much more active from 10,000 400 to 600 and called writers writing in from 10,700 to high levels and at these levels they shared positions in open interest. As far as uh, stocks in the FNO ban is concerned, Adani and Jet remain. Uh, the new entrant is Adani Enterprises. So there are three stocks in the FNO ban. Uh, the PCR moved up slightly for the Nifty from 1.57 to 1.61. The Nifty Bank PCR moved to 1.30. Uh, which are the stocks that moved on open interest build up? You had uh, uh, Apollo Hospitals which moved up 10% on high open interest build up post strong set of numbers and uh, uh, you know the demerger that they spoke about as far as the standalone pharmacy business is concerned. Madison Sumi was down 6% post a weak set of numbers. Ujjivan managed to rally, Just Dial managed to rally on decent open interest build up and NVCC post the numbers was down almost, uh, was down 7% on high open interest build up of 13%. In terms of stocks where there was short covering or unwinding, Adani Enterprises, uh, Shri Cement as well as Jet Airways uh, saw short covering. Look at the move that came in on Jet Airways and since it's in the ban, fresh positions cannot be taken on the counter. Mahanagar Gas managed to rally in trade, so there was traction that was seen. And United Breweries <coughs> saw a little bit of short covering, opened much higher, opened up 3.5%, but ended up just close to 1% in trade. So that's the traction that we're seeing on the market, Alex. All right. Uh, well, thanks so much for that, Darshan. Let's also talk about the rupee. Uh, the rupee vaulted, uh, set 34 uh, paise to close at a two-month high of 71.97 against the US dollar on Thursday. And that's on account of robust foreign fund inflows and because of the fall of crude prices in the recent past. Uh, if you look at uh, crude prices and the way they've uh, reacted over the last month and a half or so since the start of October, they've fallen over 20% and that's a huge positive for the Indian rupee and also uh, not to mention the, uh, you, uh, the yields on the benchmark uh, government bonds as well. But on to uh, another big update for the economy, on to India's trade deficit, the gap between the country's imports and exports widened in October and that's due to uh, the rising crude oil imports and a weak currency. Remember this is before uh, the real impact of the fall in uh, the uh, crude oil prices came into effect. Uh, the trade deficit in October stood at $17.13 billion compared with $14.61 billion in the same month last year. India's imports rose 17.6% compared to the same month last year and the rise was led by electronics goods and iron and steel, both of which saw a rise of over 30%. Gold imports, however, uncharacteristically fell 43% compared to last year and that is despite the early onset of the festive season. The recovery in exports continued with shipments heading out of the country rising 17.9% compared to the same month last year. The recovery in exports was led by petroleum products along with organic and inorganic chemicals. The start of the export recovery was ready-made garments which grew 36% compared with last year. Now, well, uh, while the trade deficit widened, India's weak fiscal position prompted Fitch ratings to keep its rating unchanged on India for the 12th straight year. The ratings agency maintained its triple B minus rating, which is the lowest investment grade, but it held on to a stable outlook. India's last upgrade from Fitch came in 
August of 2006. Now, Fitch has cited significant risks to India's macroeconomic outlook. It has, re it has affirmed India's long-term foreign currency issuer default rating at triple B minus with a stable outlook. It says, and I quote, balances uh, a strong medium-term growth outlook and favorable external balances relative to peers with weak uh, fiscal finances, a fragile financial sector and some lagging structural factors. Fitch also highlighted the defaults by ILNFS and some public sector banks to highlight risks in India's financial sector. Let's talk about commodities now. Yash Upadhyay is joining us with all the updates. Over to you, Yash. Morning. Good morning, Alex. Uh, crude oil prices uh, rose for a second, uh, second straight day as tensions over U.S. sanctions on uh, against Saudi Arabia countered a jump in American crude stockpiles. Brent crude on Friday rose as much as 2% after the Trump administration issued uh, fi uh, financial penalties on top, uh, on top 17 Saudi officials over the death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. However, it gave up most of its gains to end up only about 0.8% as higher, crude, higher American crude oil inventories uh, data showed that uh, crude oil uh, uh, stockpiles rose by as much as 10.27 million barrels last week, the most since February 2017. Mixed queues coming in as far as the base metal space is concerned. Uh, cuts seen in aluminum, nickel and lead. However, zinc clo uh, gained close to 3% on Thursday after data showed demand uh, significantly outstripping uh, the production and inventories uh, tracked by the London Metal Exchange sank to the lowest levels in a decade. Copper and tin, they gained, uh, they gained for a third and fourth day, respectively. Gold prices, they ended marginally higher on Thursday, on course for its first weekly gain uh, since the start of November, as traders expect uh, the metal to benefit from Brexit-related chaos. All right. Uh, thanks so much for that, Yash. Let's now talk about the stocks that you have to watch out for in the news. Agam Vakil is joining in with the stocks and news. Agam, what are the stocks on your list today? Good morning. Good morning, Alex. Well, right at the top, we will have the top gainer yesterday, Jet Airways. Considering from what we understand, according to Bloomberg, Tata Sun's boards will meet today to consider a deal with Jet. And both Tata Group and government are set to be in talks uh, with banks to take a haircut in the deal. But moving on, Tata Sponge board uh, uh, also approves the issuance of preference shares worth 1,000 uh, crore rupees to this promoter, Tata Steel. Moving in, Yes Bank, once again, some more, well, perhaps... Uh, Concerning news coming, considering from what you understand, O.P. Butt has resigned from his duty as an external expert from the search committee. And, of course, the committee was finding a successor for uh, CMD uh, Rana Kapoor, citing a conflict of interest. So we perhaps could expect more pressure uh, to build in Yes Bank. It was also one of the top losers yesterday. SRF Industries has uh, actually extended its CapEx uh, estimates from 180 crores to uh, 250 crores uh, in one of its agrochemicals plant in Gujarat. In uh, Lemon Tree as well, signs a license agreement were for about 76-room hotel in Odisha, and the hotel is expected to be completed by March 2020. Finally, when it comes down to the, uh, the Kotak Mahindra bulk deal, well, we do have the government of Singapore, which bought around uh, well half percent stake. Uh, well, Aberdeen PLC acquired about 0.1 percent stake. Normira Pension uh, and um, uh, well, uh, ING Mauritius also, uh, on the other hand, sold a little in uh, to the tune of around 0.7 percent so we're going to be watching out for how Kotak Mandra reacts in trade and finally uh, we have a report from uh, one of the papers suggesting that the government is mulling a stake sale in oil oil in o oil India ONGC as well as IOC to raise as much as uh, nearly two billion dollars in order to meet the disinvestment target so uh, these three companies will also be in focus in today's year trade. Right, Agam, thanks so much for that well <sighs> You know, if you've been tuned in to Bloomberg Quint over the past few weeks, you would have uh, looked at coverage of uh, the tensions that are currently ongoing between the government and the Reserve Bank of India with regard to some of its uh, policies. RBI Central Board Member S. Kurumurthy has backed the government in its attempt to change some of the provisioning in uh, uh, some of the provisions rather in banking norms. Gurumurthy, who was speaking at an event ahead of the RBI board meeting on Monday, said the government's effort was to ensure easier banking rules and enough credit flow in the system. Listen in to what exactly he said. The reserves are concerned. There are two studies. One Subramaniam Committee study, which says 12% reserves are standard. And then Usha Thorat study, which says some 18.76% is adequate. 
But now the Reserve Bank has some, according to the latest balance sheet, some 27, 28 percent, which would have gone up because of the depreciation in the value of the rupee. What is the reserve of the Reserve Bank actually? The appreciation in the value of the dollar is the reserve of the Reserve Bank. You bought dollar at 42, 45, and it is now 70. Just like when you buy some shares and the share values go up, and you take the appreciation as your reserve. This is the reserve. But how much of the dollar value will go down in future is a matter of uh, proper study. And in this, some policy will have to be worked out. You cannot say, come on, it has appreciated so much, give me that money. I don't think the government is asking for that. Actually, uh, my, as my understanding goes, the government is only asking for a formulation of a policy as to how much reserve the uh, central bank must have. Most of the central banks do not have reserves of this kind at all. Only the Reserve Bank has this kind of reserve. There will be clarity on several of those issues when uh, the RBI board meet takes place on Monday. Do stay tuned to all the coverage right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. Somit Sarkar is standing by with the big brokerage calls of the day though. Uh, morning Somit, what do you have for us today? Uh, good morning, Alex. And the big brokerage calls for the day first we have is Jefferies on Gale India. Now, the brokerage has maintained its buy rating on the stock with a target price of 450. Now, according to the brokerage, the near-term business conditions for Gale India has turned unfavorable for the company on the back of the fall in crude prices and rising gas prices in the U.S. Now, this uh, rising gas prices in U.S. and falling crude prices mood, uh, could lead to trading margins that would fall sharply for the company from the Q2 FY19 highs. Now, this, however, the brokerage still believes that this may reverse going forward with OPEC cuts coming in, rise in the petrochemical business margins, and because of the price hikes for the pipeline, the transmission margins would also rise for the company. So, this might change for Gale India going forward. So, that's the reason the brokerage has still maintained its uh, buy rating and the target price of 450. Second, we have is Macquarie on Thermax, and the brokerage has maintained its underperformed rating on the stock but has cut down the target price on Thermax to 846 from 866. Now, according to the brokerage, the margins of the company have led to a disappointment in the second quarter numbers of the company. Now, the second quarter numbers were very disappointed because of lower margins and that was because Thermax lacks pricing power in the industry because it is not a market leader when it comes to the construction business. Now, the brokerage also uh, advises its investors to switch to Cummins India, which is trading at a discount of around 30% when compared to Thermax and is also better when it comes to the return on equity profile and that's the reason it has uh, maintained its underperformed rating on Thermax and has cut down the target price to 846 from 866. All right, thanks so much for that, uh, Somit. Now, a Walmart store sees India as a key growth market and plans to allocate capital with a focus to expand business profitably. Speaking to Bloomberg's Emily Chang on the sidelines of the technology conference in Half Moon Bay, Walmart CTO Jeremy King discusses how the company is competing with Amazon and its plans for expanding in India. Listen in. We're really trying to focus on um, hundreds of thousands of items that you can pick up uh, in the store. So buying online, picking up in the store, making that shopping experience easy. Also, um, online grocery is a place where we're excelling. Right. And, and you are, to be fair, you're beating Amazon in that category. Yes. And so how do I focus uh, our efforts to make that shopping experience um, just like you, you would expect at a Walmart store? How do I make it um, so simple when I'm coming in to pick up my turkey and my cranberry sauce to make sure that you have uh, time to uh, get a good toy or, or a sporting good at mm -hmm. the same time? And so really focusing our efforts uh, around the omni-channel experience and uh, fresh and frozen uh, delivery and pickup is, is a big part of our strategy. With Amazon buying Whole Foods, how do you how will you stay ahead in grocery? Well, we have a significant amount of locations more than mm. we do. We have 2,100 uh, online grocery pickup locations, so the biggest in, in the U.S. at this point. Uh, and we, we're continuing to ramp that. I think we're opening like 30 or 40 stores a week that allow pickup. And then we've also done uh, delivery to, to stores. And you can imagine the technology to integrate all that and rolling that out to all of the uh, all the U.S. essentially um, as fast as we have is it's one of the, the fun parts of a technology mm -hmm. job is scaling as fast as the business can. So now, it's really about focus there. Across all the platforms, what are you doing specifically to leverage customer data to make the shopping experience faster and easier online and offline? Yeah. 
Walmart has a lot of great data, and really what we're really focused on is making a really customer-centric uh, interface. So, for example, I, I mentioned easy returns, but things like easy reorder. Oftentimes when people are buying groceries from us, they're buying 50 or 100 items. And if it only takes five or 10 seconds uh, to add an item uh, to the, the shop, you're talking about a, a 20 to 30 minute shopping experience. Mm -hmm. So how do I make that easy? You know, you're buying the same cereal and the same baby food that you did last week. So how do I make that experience of adding 100 items to the basket extremely uh, easy? And using customer data and trends and things that you did last year at this time of year uh, can really help that experience. Now, Walmart has, of course, bought Flipkart. There's a new battleground in India. You know, yes. over the course of your career, you've, you've worked in India and China. Um, how does the India battleground play out with Amazon there, with the local competitors? Well, it's early. Uh, the thing I, I'll say about uh, the one thing I say about this is that our leadership team there, Judith McKenna, is our mm -hmm. is our CEO of the International. She's got an incredible team uh, there. We've done partnerships not only with JD uh, and uh, and work uh, with Rocketon, but also, uh, as you know, the Flipkart deal. Yeah. So it's early, and typically when Walmart does an acquisition, we try and. Um, you know, let that bloom for a little bit before we help too much. Mm -hmm. We don't want uh, hug uh, technology uh, teams to death uh, mm -hmm. as we go out there. So we're really um, spending time with them to talk about their data strategy, and they're they're doing some great work on the mobile side. Um, but the uh, the international stage will be a very interesting one. In so what do you years. think the potential is in India for Walmart? Well, I mean, obviously we have stores there, so um, Judith is working on that strategy and how do I how do I use the Flipkart assets and the Walmart assets together, the similar uh, experience that we have in the U.S. Um, you report to both the CEO of Walmart e-commerce and the CEO of Walmart U.S. How does that work? Yeah, it makes the job really interesting. I mean, it's <laughs> super fun because you have somebody like Greg Ferran who I'll say is probably going to go down in history as the best sort of operator of a, of a retail company in the world. I mean, his, the discipline they put That's a big compliment. In, he's amazing. And that <laughs> team is just so incredible. But think about it. They're running a million person company effectively. We have 1.1 million associates. Uh, and just their operational excellence and efficiency and their focus on not only things like price and co customer experience and just the ability to execute that is, is fascinating. And then you've got Mark on the other side who's like a true innovator and um, he's got a, a idea every minute and we're experimenting all over the place. So you've got the combination of the two, it makes my job great. All right, but the big talking point in India with regard to Walmart is the resignation of Benny Bansal, the founder of Flipkart. You can read all about that on the website, bloombergquin.com. But there is also several other stories on the website. Currently, you'll find all of that and more. You'll find all the live market action right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. Uh, just log on over the course of the day. Right uh, now, let me tell you about a couple of stories. Hospita um, sorry, hospitality startup Oyo uh, Hotels has appointed former Indigo President Aditya Ghosh as its chief executive officer uh, for India and South Asia markets with effect from December 1, 2018. And Infosys appointed Jayesh uh, Sangraj, Sangrajka as its interim chief financial officer as incumbent MD Ranganath's term ends tomorrow. Now, a pearl and diamond pendant owned by Marie Antoinette before she was beheaded during the French Revolution sold for $36 million at an auction on Wednesday, shattering its pre-sale estimate of just up to $2 million. Take a look. World record for a pearl, 32 million francs, selling it. So. <laughs> Well, that's all we have for you in this edition of Daybreak and in, fi in fact for the rest of the week. But do tune in for the rest of the shows over the course of the day. And also, I'll see you back on Monday. Thanks so much for watching. This is Bloomberg Quint.